How's everybody doing? Yes, good. Energy. Excellent. Uh, thanks for the intro, Jared. Uh, as, as you mentioned, my name's Leah Bewley. I am an analyst at Forrester Research focusing on the customer experience field. And not long ago, I wrote a book called The User Experience Team of One. It's kind of based on that, that presentation that Jared made. And um, the user experience team of one is all about how uh, design and user experience professionals can use collaboration as a technique to enlist their non-UX counterparts and do better work. So I'm, I'm really interested in the concept of collaboration and how we work in organizations. But uh, after I wrote this book, um, I started to think about a kind of um, uh, a different question, a related but sort of flipped question, which is, are there points in the process where collaboration and working with your non-UX counterparts uh, is not appropriate, actually, and where there's a different kind of tool that we need to uh, lean upon? And that's what led me to the presentation that we're going to uh, see today. So this is about really you and the amount of confidence that you, each of you sitting here right now, have in your gut to know what good looks like and to be able to say that in a credible way with the people that you work with. So that's what we're going to dig into. Um, to start with a factoid, a little forest factoid, um, what we have to offer right now. This is a really great time to be doing experience design. 47% uh, of companies, according to a recent Forrester survey, uh, say they want to be the customer experience leaders in their whole industry. And on top of that, an additional 13% of companies have even bigger ambitions. They want to be the customer experience leaders bar none across all industries. Everyone wants to wow customers and users through great design. And they don't know how to do it. And they're looking to us for help. So this is a really good time to be doing the kind of work that we're doing. And thankfully, we have really good tools to do it. We have a kind of processes that have been honed and refined over time that put users at the center. And we do great research. We, uh, we do great iterative design. We know how to test. We know how to create prototypes. We know how to engage with technology to really build great experiences. Um, so that's good. Um, but what I've found, at least in my career over time, particularly as you get to sort of progressively kind of higher levels of influence, is that there are so many opportunities for that to go off script. <laughs> and um, they usually come in the form of a question where somebody says, well, what do you think we should do? Or uh, what's the best practice here? Or why can't we make it whatever way I want to make it? Um, and I'm... Uh, I'm a, like a disciple of the religion of user-centered design. So my answer to this question historically has been, we need to test it with users. We need to go back to the users. We need to understand from that point of view. Um, but what I found over time is, that is uh, that's not a very persuasive argument to a lot of people. Number one, it's inefficient. Number two, it's hedging. Makes it sound like you don't actually know your own craft. And three, it squanders a, a kind of interesting opportunity to foster a culture of critique where we actually all feel like we can talk about what good design looks like. So, um, thinking about that process, I started to reflect, where, where are all those moments where people are going to freak out and they don't necessarily believe in the vision, and you need to help them believe that the vision is right? Where are the moments where uh, we could be wrong, but we're going to make a leap of faith and we'll learn through interacting with users what the right thing is? Where are the moments where we have to just like crumple it up and do a do-over? And do we have enough confidence in ourselves to actually make that case to our colleagues? Um, Maybe before I advance to the next slide, I'll ask you all to reflect on how confident you feel you master those moments. In your am I really great at helping people veer when we need to veer, or do I, or do I sort of stick to the process primarily? Um, now we're going to test you. OK, are you ready? Um, this is simple. It's an easy test. There's no right answers. Um, but uh, what I'm going to show you a couple different examples of design. Designed experiences. And I'm going to ask you guys to sort of gauge if you think it's good design or bad design, OK? So here's the first one. This is Ber Berkshire Hathaway's website. How many of you know Berkshire Hathaway? Probably everybody, right? They're like the biggest um, holding company in the world. They own Geico in entirety. They own big chunks of Coca-Cola and IBM and Wells Fargo. They own everything on the planet. And this is their website. So take a moment. Ask yourself, is this good design? How many of you think it is good design? Okay, like 10 for 5, 10%. How many of you think it's bad design? Less than the first group. How many of you don't know? 
and like 60% of you are just too afraid to raise your hands. You are true hedgers. You don't have any answers. Well, you may be thinking, I can't say if this is good design because I don't know enough about the user's needs. I don't know the business goals. I don't know tasks and scenarios. And that's true. You would need to know all of that to be able to really completely evaluate whether this is good design. But the fact that more than half of you are unwilling to raise a hand right now is concerning because in general, you should be able to walk into any organization and say, this is bad design. Look at that, that's it's antiseptic nothingness on this screen. So what you have here is a, a, you know, some orderly bullets, very good. But there's absolutely no emotional engagement. There's very little ability to actually just interpret what the hell this thing is without reading in very fall, small fine print text, which happens to be in jargon, so you couldn't interpret it anyway. There's confusing brand relationships, so you don't even know who this comes from. This is pretty objectively just on base, bad design. In fact, it's so bad that Forbes magazine called this one of the ugliest billionaire websites in the world. And not that the guys at Forbes know anything about design, but when those guys are calling it bad design, you can say it's bad design. And if a room full of designers can't stand up and say that, then we've got a problem as an industry. So how about this? Is this good design or bad design? This is Nowness. How many, how many of you know Nowness? A few of you? It's a channel for arts and culture video programming. Um, so take a moment, look at it. Is this good design or bad design? Good? How many of you would raise your hand? Of you? 10, maybe 5, 10%? How many of you would raise your hand? More. 30%. Oh, my mic is cutting out. Mm. Okay, let's try this. And how many of you don't know? Okay. So now this is interesting because compared to the Berkshire Hathaway example, it is um, immediately more emotionally engaging, primarily because the interface is all content. There's not a lot of um, kind of uh, UI cruft. There's photography that's compelling, kind of pulls you in. There's uh, restrained and consistent use of typography so that you can read things, but they don't actually distract you from things. It uses a really clean and spare grid. It's symmetrical, which human beings tend to find aesthetically pleasing. It uses some sort of common best practices these days around navigation with a little hamburger in the corner. Um, this is, I'll, I'll, I'll make a stand. I'll go out and say empirically, I think this is good design. And I think I'm not the only one who thinks that. Webby's gave Nowness an award for great design this last year because it's a great experience that's engaging, it has great content, and it's, it's a clean and aesthetically enjoyable environment. So uh, one last example, one last test. Um, this is mention number two today of United. Uh, this is the United website. Is this good design? How many of you say yes? Two, oh, Jared, Jared, uh, three of you, okay. Uh, how many of you say no? Wow, most of you, okay. How many of you don't know? All right, One, a few of you. This is the most definitive uh, kind of uh, sense of design that we've had in the room so far in our little gut test. And, you know, it's interesting because if you look at this, this example, unlike Berkshire, Berkshire Hathaway, it's clear that this has been designed. Somebody put work into this. There's a... Uh, consistent use of a kind of color palette. There's professional, but maybe kind of stock photography. There's um, consistent typography. There's sort of, you know, common best practices around navigation and things like that. And yet, the overall effect is just organized chaos. It's this sort of uh, static of information. And what you get when you have the United uh, example is I think what we see in a lot of organizations, which is that people have made a good faith effort to design a lot of different components and sort of fit it all into an experience, but too few people at too many important points in the process said, my gut is telling me this is wrong. There's too much going on here and this is going to be a bad experience. Now you could say that the industry just like requires that you have to have this kind of an experience because there's so many users and because they need to do so many things that you just have to cram it all in like the Swiss Army knife. But this is the new Southwest site. And this accomplishes you know, the same things that United accomplishes, but it does it in a much more modern and engaging way. Um, and so it's uh, just having a lot of users is not an excuse for having poor design. What really needs to happen is somebody needs to step up and talk about what good looks like in an organization. So um, in, in these kinds of evaluations, some of you will have an upper hand because some of you have more formal training in things like type, color, layout, and imagery. Um, but uh, in, a, in the user experience field, a lot of us don't. A lot of us have more of a research bent or we come at it from you know, a slightly more kind of uh, information systems-y kind of perspective. But you too 
can have confident instincts. And it's because you have other tools in your toolkit. Specifically, you have your own visceral response. You have sight and what your brain does when it immediately interacts with something. And you have the feelings in your body that tell you some information. And you have the action that you feel compelled to do in that first moment when you engage with an experience. That first moment is everything, by the way. There's been a lot of research that shows that first impressions you know, are lasting and they matter and that they happen in 50 milliseconds, which is you know, super fast. How fast is 50 milliseconds? Um, okay, everybody blink your eyes right now. Quickly blink. All right, that was 300 to 400 milliseconds. So you just, in that moment, could have made six to eight first impressions about the environment around you. And so that's... Um, that's the, uh, the thing that you need to sort of key into when you're engaging with um, a kind of component of design to try to listen to that receptor, the 50 millisecond receptor. And I have a, a kind of method that I, well, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna advocate for today, which I'm gonna call the gut test. It's basically what I would ask you guys to do in the, the sort of little toy problem we just did with the, the three different design examples, which is to go through a sort of a process of considerations in that first moment that you engage with a design. The first thing being paying attention to that first moment. Uh, and then we'll go on through, talk about some other things too. Asking, what do I notice? How does it feel? Et cetera, et cetera. But let's begin with paying attention to the first moment. So in that first moment, there's a lot of powerful information. And I first sort of learned this or saw this actually with a case study years ago at the IA Summit from the design firm Maya out of Pittsburgh. They did some work with Carnegie Libraries, which is an old and venerated library institution in uh, Pennsylvania, and um, what they did is basically um, kind of undercover research to help design the library of the future. Um, and so their process was really actually a very classic user experience method, but I didn't know it at the time. They essentially, guerrilla style, went into the library and documented all of their first impressions as they had them. So this is a photo of walking into the library and immediately they notice, what do they notice? They hear a bell and the bell is a rather unfriendly auditory symbol that they better get the hell out of the library pretty fast because it's about to close. They see a security guard who creates the sense that this is maybe not a safe environment or at least they're not super welcomed. They think about things like how it smells and sort of just the general feeling they have of being in that environment. And then they you know, fig try to figure out where they can get help. They approach this, which is a reference desk. Um, I have a library science degree, so the idea of a reference desk to me is not controversial. It's like, that's the heart and soul of the library. But Maya was able to see that this looks like somebody super messy's desk that you would never want to approach. So they, they helped to kind of unpack a lot of the associations that Carnegie Libraries has about its own kind of internal environment. So that kind of um, approach is, is, a, is a really useful technique for, even if you're just doing looking at a purely digital experience, kind of documenting the first thing I noticed, the second thing I noticed, the third thing I noticed. Um, the problem, though, with that approach is that those first 50 milliseconds happen fast, and then very quickly there's another force that's starting to work against them, which is the mirror exposure effect. And uh, the mirror exposure effect says that basically the more we look at something, the more we like it. Um, so if you, as a designer or a user experience professional or a product manager or anybody, work with a product day in and day out, you may have had some useful information in that first encounter with it that becomes progressively harder and harder to access over time. You combine that 50 milliseconds and the mirror exposure effect and you have this greater distance from your own gut and your own hunches and instincts. So the gut test, you know, which, you know, with the five steps, is in a way all about reaccessing those initial instincts in the way that you interact with designed elements. So if you first, obviously you observe the first moment, but as we just learned, the first moment goes fast and there are forces working against it. So the next thing you do is ask yourself, if I'm already really familiar with it, but I'm coming back to it, okay, this is really, this is really basic. This is the most important thing. If you take away nothing here today, take away this. If you're looking at something, you're already super familiar with it and you don't, necessarily like you feel like you're having a hard time accessing your gut, take a moment and close your eyes for five seconds and then reopen them and pay attention to what hits you. And that's a, a little like jolt to kind of get the first, ex the first moment back in. So the, the sort of the jolt of the, the first 50 milliseconds can be stimulated by giving yourself sort of a five second test, a blink test. So once you do that sort of first like, okay, I already know what this room looks like and I'm kind of familiar with it already, but I'm gonna close my eyes again and one, two, three, four, five, I'm gonna open them, what do I notice? 
All right, now I'm primed again. It's like a little bit of ginger in my mouth after a bite of sushi. And now when you're asking yourself, what do you notice, there's a lot of extra information that's going to come in. So I first saw this actually when I was um, years ago working on a project at Adaptive Path. And I, it was a, I was doing a review with um, one of the, the founders, this guy Peter Merholtz, and he, he was looking actually at a, just a wireframe, really early kind of sketch of what something could be. And he... I'd been laboring over it and thinking about all the constraints that it sort of, you know, satisfied. And he looked at it for a second, and he kind of closed his eyes, and he opened his eyes, and he said, what is it that you want them to do? What do you want them to see? There's too much. There's nothing that's actually going to really call their attention to anything. So how can you simplify so that they know the main thing that they need to do? And his instincts were good because there's been research that shows this kind of thing is important. A team of researchers at the University of Michigan did work to show that when you give somebody a, a, um, a complicated designed element to look at, uh, the number of components in that element has a relationship, a consistent relationship to the uh, appeal of that element to people. And it's this funny kind of lopsided bell curve where too little stuff is, is not appealing. Um, but very quickly, the sort of the right balance of just, just north of nothing be, is very appealing. And then right after that, the more components you cram into a design, the less appealing it becomes. Um, so well, let's look at nowness again, and we'll ask ourselves, how many components does nowness have? How many of you say it has two components? Some of you. How many of you say it has like 10 components? How many of you think it has 20 components? More than that. OK. Um, the answer is all of the above, actually. And the way to answer that, to answer that, let's look at another discipline. Let's look at architecture. Um, and a, an example like this. This is Mellon Auditorium in Washington, DC. So how many components does Mellon Auditorium have? Well, Mellon has a lot of different components. It's got tons and tons of parts. It's got, you know, columns and funny torches and friezes and all kinds of things that make it a very complicated uh, object. But it's highly approachable because it uses classic principles from tripartite architecture that make it feel really simple. It has these masses that essentially create visual groupings to tie the components together. And the effect of that is that from far away it feels simple and then the details get progressively more evident the closer that you get. And uh, Nowness is doing the same thing, interestingly enough. So they have, you know, lots of parts, little uh, text lines and calls to action and doohickeys here and there. But the overall effect through really great uh, kind of parts and masses is that it feels like a very simple design. Look again at United. The problem with United is they have a lot of masses, actually, but they're all of equal weight, so the overall effect ends up being very busy. Um, another example from NASA, I was going to honor the Orion launch today, but they just delayed it a day. But anyway, so NASA recently redesigned. This is sort of what their old site looked like. It's missing a little bit of information. But, you know, it's some good masses and some parts. But then they redesigned, and it's just all mass. It's beautiful. It's like it just sucks you in. And then the way that they deal with progressively disclosing detail is, is, is through interaction. So you kind of hover over or touch on the ring of igniting stars, and you get a little bit more information. And then you, you kind of move through the page, and a little more information comes up. So they're, they're creating um, the parts through time rather than actually within, within a specific layout itself. So a tip if you want to sort of pay attention to what you notice in a designed environment or at a designed element is look for the parts and the masses and bonus, think in terms of moments, not layouts. Okay, Pet step, two, step three if you want to kind of access your hunches is ask how does this feel? How do I feel when I'm engaging with this thing? And this feels um, suspiciously like brand. <laughs> this is like brand. Um, and Uber, and sec second example today of Uber, uh, Uber is a doing a really good job kind of making a coherent experience between the brand objectives and the actual felt experience. So this statement came from uh, Shailen Amin, who's on the design team. Uber moves people it, with their new kind of brand, com brand uh, kind of um, com proposition. It informs the messaging and design from the more aspirational on the go photography and tight action oriented diction to the highlighted features and explanations of service. And so you see um, aspirational sort of action, uh, kind of um, modern and sort of jet setter feeling that is reflected in the brand, uh, in the, in the type out, or in the uh, logo. Uh, you see it in the design of digital components. You see it in the decisions that are made about the actual uh, logistics and uh, the experience of getting into an Uber car. You see it in the simplified sort of action-oriented, but uh, clean, very um, sort of directionally focused uh, interactions in the mobile application. 
And overall, it creates a very tight and consistent sort of feeling. So the tip for this one is when you do the kind of blink test, uh, ask yourself, uh, what do I feel? What words would I use to describe what I feel? If I don't feel anything, <laughs> neither will anyone who uses this thing. And things that don't make us, f I think Jared did a really um, great setup this morning helping us realize that emotion is, is it, it's the starting point for experiences these days, not the end point. So that's um, the feeling. And then step four, when you do your blink test and open your eyes, after you say, what do I notice? How does it feel? Is to ask, how prototypical does it feel? How much does it conform to the expectations that I have of what I should be noticing? Um, the Google research team did some work that showed that designs of low prototypicality are generally considered unattractive. And what that means is, we have patterns in our mind for how certain things should look and behave, and when they don't behave that way, it creates dissonance <laughs> that makes us think we don't like the thing. Um, so, and you can see these patterns really early on. It used in the foundational design work that we do in sketching and wireframes, all of a sudden you, the pattern starts to emerge. And then when the sort of ultimate sort of living, breathing design comes to life, the pattern should still be evident. And even when the design itself is actually not so great, the extent to which the pattern is evident still makes you feel comforted and confident in interacting with that product. And in designs where perhaps the, you know, certain components of it are, are really lovely, like great photography or some interesting pieces, the breaking from the pattern, not being prototypical, makes it less likable and less trustworthy. You can see it in other industries like banking. You know, this is a kind of standard banking app and, or banking wireframe, and it has p uh, elements of pattern that make us confident that we could trust this thing, like lists of, of, um, of transactions and large sums of money listed somewhere. And so you can skin that cat a lot of different ways, and it will all still feel sort of trustworthy, like, a, like uh, well, this will feel trustworthy. But then the more you start to change from the pattern, the more it makes you pause and think, what the hell am I looking at? And if you really deviate too far from pattern, it starts to make you just doubt the, the, the reliability and validity of the thing. So pattern and, and prototypicality matter a lot, which is not to say you can't break from the genre. Interestingly, eBay is starting to break from its own sort of pattern of like what a, what a, um, uh, a, 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 an auction marketplace should look like, and they're doing all this kind of curated content collection, but they've earned the right to do that by having a lot of trust built up already. So make sure you've tested the heck out of it if you're gonna break from a pattern. Um, and then the last tip in that sort of blink test, after you've said, what do I notice? Uh, how do I feel? How much does it conform to my expectations? Is to ask, what do I feel compelled to do from this step? What can I do? Um, and I think within our field, we often talked about this, or have over the years talked about this a lot as a, a, a matter of um, affordances. So like, does it look like I can touch that button? Does it look like that thing is interactive? And I, you know, I think flat design has, is sort of changing the nature of that, and not because um, it's the design trend du jour necessarily, but because in a world where everything is content, and content is the interface, everything actually has affordances. You can, you, you know, everything should go somewhere. So what that does is it starts to pr place a greater burden not on could I do something with this thing, but do I want to do something with this thing? Is, is, is the scent of information desirable enough that I want to follow it? And to address that, what I do in my mind in that moment of the blink test is I try to figure out what's a story that I could tell um, about who's going to use this, and how can I help, how can I, um, well, does this design actually work for that story, let's say. So what I mean is really very practically, like calling on user data in my mind to be able to kind of connect it to how I think someone's going to use that thing. And I don't mean like user data in the sense of kind of segments and demographics and stuff like that. I mean more like a story that I recently encountered when I was interacting with somebody. Um, this is a little um, uh, a spotted on the back door of a bathroom stall at Intuit, my previous employer, and it's just a quick customer story that one of the research just sort of threw one of the researchers threw up there. Got a moment for a quick story. This is a guy. He owns a small business that tutors kids who are just out uh, who have um, developmental d disabilities, and he helps them get ready for their SATs and. What he does is he has a nine-person business, and he uh, often hires the kids who used to be his, his uh, employees. And so it's really like a family. They're, they really love and look out for each other. And he's all about helping kids. So when he has to make decisions about his business, uh, it distracts him from what he really wants to do. And he also doesn't feel very confident in doing it. So that's like a real story to hold on to. And 
the interesting thing to ask yourself is how many real stories from your customers do you have in your mind right now? And how often are you doing research that enables you to call upon one of those really visceral anecdotal stories? Jared's done a, a good job sort of um, encouraging everybody to have lots of user exposure hours. Two hours every six weeks, right? Is that what it is? Yeah. If you do that, he says, you're going to have better design. So that's something to test out. Um, so let's talk about stories in this case. So here's an example of a designed element that I encountered not long ago. This comes from Square Cash. Um, I, I, so you see this design, and you think, what the hell is this? OK, there is, it's I mean, it's interesting. It's like really clean. If I follow through the emotion, it feels like the green makes me feel like money, which makes me nervous but also intrigued. And um, I don't know what I can do exactly. So I need to situate it in the context of a story. So let's figure out what the story for this would be. Story is that uh, two friends go out to lunch, or a group of friends go out to lunch, and they one borrows money from the other. And so then the next day, one of them gets an email that says, uh, give me 20 bucks. <laughs> and then you click the link of the email, and then here you are. And it starts to make more sense now in the context of a story. And if I'm thinking in, in terms of my story hat, all I want to do is pay my friend back as quickly as possible so she doesn't think I'm a shirker. So I'm going to figure, oh, that little box at the bottom looks really juicy in terms of an action that I want to interact with to provide payment information. And then maybe it takes me to a screen that you know does ask for some more information. I'm, because I'm compelled based on the story, I, I can rationalize how the design gets me through. So that's a, a tip for that is to understand if the action makes sense in that moment. Uh, tell real stories and don't settle for data that's dressed up in people's clothes. So those were five sort of little recommendations for how to tap into your own hunches and your own gut test. And I guess the thought that I'll part with is that the gut test is good for in the moment kind of critiquing behavior, but it's also, it has a bigger purpose. And that is to behave um, with greater confidence as leaders in your organization around design. The gut test, in my view, is really a leadership test. Because what I see in the work that I'm doing at Forrester and what I saw at Intuit and what I'm seeing throughout the industry is that leaders desperately want us to actually tell them what the right thing to do is. But they want us to do it in a way that they can believe. And our processes help us do that, but also being credible in the moment and being persuasive in the moment helps us do that too. So um, I'm going to skip my own Peter Drucker quote because uh, Des and I didn't coordinate beforehand. Uh, but uh, on that, I I'll end with just um, some credits for the great photography that I used and a little bit of a request for a favor, actually. I'm doing research right now on the relationship between user experience and customer experience in organizations. And so I have a survey. And if you're interested in filling out my survey, go to that link. Um, and if you want to contact me, of course, use the email. Thanks, everybody. That, that was awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, we, have, we have time for some questions. Uh, I, have a, I have a quick question for you, which is uh, this, this notion of um, having, having the pride of knowing that our, as designers, we have training and experience, but at the same time needing to, to uh, uh, do these different checks and bring that forward. A at what point do we do we need to, to sort of put humility into our own process? Do you think? Mm. I mean, at all points, for sure. Yeah, I think that's that's a that's a big and awesome question. I I think the the to be honest, the the book, the user experience team of one, is a lot about humility across the process and about trying to set up. Um, critiquing and sort of uh, co-design structures that enable you to be a humble facilitator of, of your colleagues. And so I think humility is actually the default behavior for the process. Uh, but then uh, there, you know, I just, I think there are sort of, there are these moments when I sit in meetings and I, and I reflect on like, who do they need me to be right now as a designer? And it, what it turns out is sometimes what they need you to be is someone who can make them believe that design is worth doing and make them believe that the risk is going to pay off. And so then what I do, it's really a stupid, really stupid trick, but it's, I'll try it if you want. Um, I actually imagine that I'm, that I'm, that I'm, well, frankly, I imagine I'm George Clooney. I imagine like, okay, what if I am like the most convincing, suave, believable, like confidence inspiring person in the world? How can I help you feel like the answer I have is going to help us get to a place that we need to be. And that is, it serves a purpose to further the design, but what it also does is it serves to 
um, unstick everybody's anxiety about how design should work as a process overall and get us to the next step where we'll really learn through testing and other methods if the right thing is there. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, we have time for a quick question from Paul. Paul. I'll hi. be very quick then. Uh, I, mean, I, I believe I trust I your guts, but how do you train your guts? What do you do to calibrate and teach your guts? Yeah, uh, great question. I, I think actually this, these exercises that I've sort of just talked about do train your guts over time, but what I also would say is um, really you can, let's put it this way, number one, listen to really great designers who make you fall in love with what they're saying. And uh, what I often saw in my career is that um, you hire like super hotshot agencies and they come in and the way they talk makes uh, like, the, um, like the executives have you know, hearts on their eyelids when they blink. It's like, whatever you're saying, I believe it. So, like, paying attention actually to the language they use, the way they construct an argument, the way they let stories unfold, and then, like, literally writing that down afterwards can be actually a really uh, interesting education. And then the other thing is just paying attention to the world around you, actually. Um, there's, I mean, you can do really dumb things, like go on an inspiration walk, or go on a, you know, or keep a little notebook and write down the things that you're sort of noticing in the designs that you're interacting with in a digital way, but also in the physical world. It's a, it's a muscle, and you can exercise it, is what I would say. And with that, uh, thanks so much for being su uh, such great listeners, Thank you guys. so yeah. much, Leah. <laughs>